Hello and welcome to the Blue Monday podcast, now in our sixth season, looking into the exciting happenings of Ipswich Town Football Club every week on video and audio. I'm Richard Woodard and joining me for his first appearance since the win over Shrewsbury, hoping that he doesn't pull a hamstring in the intro, Craig Fimbo. Hello to Craig and back in the team, consistent performer, always sevens or eights out of ten from him. Welcome back to Joe Fairs. We'll start... Craig, with you, belated Happy New Year. So your first appearance of 2021. How how are you? Oh, yeah. Um, loving life. Yeah. Um, en- enjoying uh, being able to get out and about and doing everything that, uh, that we're allowed to. Mm-hmm. So uh, <clears throat> luckily, you know, waiting for the weekend so we can enjoy the football to just take that uh, stress out of the week that <laughs> the we've just enjoyed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. <clears throat> and Joe, you need to tell us about this. this um, for those of you who are watching in black and white, um, Joe, this is is this a limited edition goalkeeper shirt that you've managed to find a bargain in Planet Blue? Tell us about it. Yeah, it's the two, 2015-2016 change third choice goalkeeper shirt that was only worn once away at MK Dons because their white kit clashed with our green goalkeeper kit, presumably. So And never put on general sale either? Never put on general sale. So no, that is unique. Uh, definitely a collector's item. Yeah, yeah. I bought it for... Either ten or fifteen pound. I reckon I could probably sell it for at least a sort of fifty to seventy p profit at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get on the eBay. Exactly right. I I do like a goalkeeper third kit, but I'm still. I mean, I I, have, I do this maybe once or twice a season. If anyone has one of the Umbro keeper kits from the nineties, XL or L, who wants to sell me one, I will. You know, I'll write you a blank check pretty much as long as it's in decent nick. So um, there's that advert, and I'm sure, actually, Joe, you're probably in the same boat, aren't you? Rich can sleep in it and dream that he's Craig Forrest. Exactly right. My favourite ever player. Um, Craig, you've not got anything in the loft, have you, that I might be able to... That's not quite an not... open-ended question, by the way. I didn't mean it to say like that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feed them? No, Stop, sorry. I was going to say, certainly, certainly not in L or XL, because all my old stuff, even oh, my, yeah, yeah, my yeah. little boy's now grown out of that, you know, when I was five, six, seven. He's, I did have a, a um, pristine white, Pioneer um, pin, black pinstripe oh. um, that he wore you know, when he was five or six once or twice and since, yeah, growing out. He's now wearing, well, and he doesn't because he's not that interested in football at the moment, but w- when I can persuade him to, he wears the, uh, obviously, the, the um, Lyle promotion kit that was mine and has, has passed down. So he just about squeezes into a, what I did when I was 15, 16. He's doing now when he's 30. That's some good parents in there as well. Got to love some football hipster shirts, the original. So you've got quite a collection Joe for your boys haven't you yeah I've got loads of them that I just pick up when I see them off eBay they, they, they're at an age where they like wearing them at the moment but I'm sure they'll soon grow out of it once they sort of re- <laughs> realise they're a third they're division doing. team once they appreciate they can have like a cane or son on the back of it rather than uh, judge yeah. or no low no no low yep um, well I mean I always say this when we, I'm not going to drag this one out guys unnecessarily um Obviously, the main topic of conversation today, the the Burton victory. Um, but frankly, it's probably more to delve into in the pre-match press conferences. It was a quote fest on Friday, from, not just from Lambert, from Stephen Ward. Um, let's kind of tie the week together. We're off the back, obviously, of that disappointing defeat at home to Swindon. Live on the telly, the Sky Hoodoo is back. Um, and Luke Wolfenden's insightful post-match um, and more about Luke Wolfen in a bit. Um, and then Monday, this this report from the Football Insider blog, which I think is fairly reputable, um, includes Darren Bent amongst its pundits, apparently, um, claims that there is a dressing room mutiny and Marcus Evans is looking into um, possible replacements if Lambert were to be sacked. Um, I guess I don't really want too much of your views on that. I think, well... If you, unless you want to, you know, I think we can draw our own conclusions. Perhaps more interestingly is is the rebuttals that have followed, not least from Paul Lambert, um, who says, I'm pretty sure you can ask any player about it, and I've never had a falling out with them. I'm, I have a laugh with them. I'm a chilled out kind of guy. I never have any arguments with them. I tell them if I don't think they're doing well. Um, the world is brilliant, isn't it? You read a tweet and you um, you guys believe it. I can't do anything about that. And Stephen Ward, the spokesman of the dressing room, supposedly um, claimed um, no, not at all. Um, 
everyone's behind the manager. We believe in the manager. We believe in his philosophies. More about his philosophies in a second and what he wants us to achieve. Um, but everyone here is on completely on the same page. There's not one bit of disharmony and everyone wants to achieve promotion. That's how it is. Well, that's that's me convinced. Joe, <laughs> <laughs> are you convinced? Um, well, my views are I live I live in Ipswich. It's quite a small town. I'm sure most people who live in the town sort of speak to people and it is absolute bollocks basically <laughs> that it is a united behind dressing room united behind Lambert. It might be united dressing room, but there is no chance that it is how Lambert says it. It it just isn't the case and like I say, I'm I'm sure enough of our listeners have spoken to enough people involved in the football club to know that this just isn't the case. It's like I say, it was it was terrible in the summer. I, I think it was hinted at by, like I say, you look on those of the days, you see Phil's posts. Now he's persona non grata. You can see some of the stuff that Andy and Stu have hinted at and mentioned in podcasts. I say it doesn't take much reading between the lines to realise that it just isn't the case. It's not a good dressing room at the moment because the players seemingly neither like nor respect Lambert. And, and Craig Luke Wolf in his interview um, was pretty eye-opening on, on the excuses um, point but um, I guess the football insider, as we said, I, I was at pains to mention that it's fairly reputable. I think there's guys involved who have previously worked for Sky there. Obviously, they've got, you know, I, mean, I was going to mention Gabby Egbonnor, um, but they've got some good pundits as well. So they're, they're a fairly reputable source. So therefore, they're not going to pluck this kind of story from thin air, are they? Well, no, certainly. Well, you wouldn't think it's certainly not for a League One team either, are they? It's no. not as if it's going to be head, headline news. Premier League sort of um, level. It's interesting to hear that Lambert says he's never fallen out with players or doesn't fall out with players. Does someone want to see if they can get in touch with Jordan Spence and over in California, wherever he is, and ask him uh, ask him if he's ever fallen out with maybe Danassian as well? Or Jordan um, Graham or Darren yeah. Ben. Or... Yeah. <laughs> Going back to Wolfenden's comments, he, poor old guy, looked like a broken man, didn't he, in that yeah. um, interview after the match? And again, as Joe's saying, it doesn't take much to, to work out what's going on behind the scenes. It doesn't take much to work out who... If you if you listened or watched yesterday's match with no commentary, it w- wouldn't take much for you to work out who he's referring to in terms of comments being made or instructions being provided that are contrary to, to what the players think they should be doing. I think, Christ, it was pretty much a 90-minute soundtrack of Stuart Taylor gobbing off yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, you only have to listen back because on the, on the Sky coverage, it had fake crowd noise against Swindon. But if you actually watch the highlights back, you hear everything being said. And as they pick up the ball in midfield for the first goal, all you hear is press, 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 which drags the whole team out of shape. Yes. And, and Chambers becomes like a say, scapegoat. Well, like I say, it doesn't matter who the scapegoat is on it. But ultimately, they're being instructed from the sideline to go and press. They go and press and then they're just pulled out of shape. Yeah. Uh, five, minute, five minutes before the end yesterday, he felt the need to scream at international footballer Alan Judge to take the ball into the corner to, <laughs> to waste a bit of time. I'm sure Judge may have worked that one out for himself, but if that's what he's there to do. That's what he's there to do. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I had a pretty crap Friday work-wise and then part way through the morning. Um, was it in the evening or maybe Thursday night? It was um, uh, Andy Warren's article saying that the EADT understands that Lambert retains the support, the full support of Mark Evans. I mean, how much we can read into these kind of things, you know, I'm, I'm sure perhaps when um, Paul Hurst was sacked or um, there was some support before before the axe fell. Um, but Lambert's press conference on Friday, I mentioned it at the start. I mean, it, it kind of had a real um, aura of kind of fake news and disingenuousness about it, which I think, you know, you can talk about Lambert's failings on the pitch but obviously a lot of us you know we've talked about on the show the patience has kind of run out with Lambert and and these kind of press conferences where he kind of gives a bit of bluff and um the, you know the bravado are, yeah it, exactly it? right is is he confident this is I'm quoting from TWTD is is he confident Evans will continue to back him I don't really care to be honest what do you do I said to, to this last season if Marcus says to, to go you go if Marcus says you stay you stay I don't have a problem I get really well with him I don't really get involved in this stuff um, and then we get the you have to remember I was at the highest level of football I know how it works I've worked with unbelievable managers no stress no nothing pure stone cold focus on what I had to do are, are, 
we all get a little bit bored of Lambert. Is that actually in his, in his interest maybe to not do press conferences or, or maybe for us to not read them? Because I don't think you, you learn anything new, do you? You just get the same old PR and spin. He's getting to the point whereby, like it was towards the end of McCarthy's reign, and it's just doing it for the, just doing it. He's dialing them in, as you'd say, isn't he? He's just going yeah. through the motions of answering questions in a certain manner. As you say, he's not offering anything. He's been popping up on Five Live more mm. often than he's been popping up on local media, which is very bizarre why you'd ask Paul Lambert his opinion on anything. Particularly, <laughs> I suppose it's because he had COVID and therefore was a bit more yes. closer to it than than most in, in terms of managers and, and the football side of things. But yeah, I I, I didn't listen to his... Um, I read I read the report in the EADT. I, I didn't go to the... The lengths of actually listening to it because it'd only end up winding you, winding you up. I don't more. think they actually have, they're available to listen to anymore, are they? No. I think... Well, no. The, no, I meant his like internal um, club one that. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, and he uh, he DT now do the transcript, don't they? Well, yeah, exactly. Um, and that, uh, as uh, Joe's pointed out before, there's only one reason why the local rag starts putting the transcript of interviews. Yes. On their website or it's on kind the, of their, the, the, the tick newspaper. box of the kind of slow, inevitable, inexorable. Yeah. Um, ending hopefully um, yeah as you mentioned I've been doing the rounds on Friday um, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on the, you know obviously um, we give us our, our sympathy because he's obviously been um, really affected um, by COVID and, and is still on, coming back from his recovery um, which we obviously as a human being we wish him well um, your thoughts on his opinions about football continuing to con- um, is, is morally wrong <laughs> It kind of well, felt like, like I say, in the, in, the, in the heart of the coronavirus crisis in March last year, when it was all kicking off, he was the manager of the team that was desperate to carry on playing with the chairman, trying to get a 10-team playoff put towards, the, sort of to allow us to give us any hope of promotion. And he was desperate for anything to, any, to happen. And now it's looking like, oh, he might lose his job because he's, doing such a poor job at the moment it's oh no we shouldn't be playing or it's morally wrong if we're playing but say if, if if people have that opinion i'm not saying it's the wrong opinion to have but it also there has to be an element of consistency to it me i've always wanted football to carry on i was disappointed it ended last year i, I could understand the reasons but i've ultimately wanted it to come back and that's still the case i think it does more good than it does bad personally but you can't just flip flop around with what suits you at the time yeah, and it does yeah, feel that Steve Bruce is another same. one who has come out and said that football should stop. And it, it does feel like the most vocal people are the ones who would benefit from maybe a, a pause to reset and recalibrate. Sorry, Craig, go on. No, I was going to say, you know, as, as you say, a cynic may suggest that it's partly due of having a season curtail before it turns to shit again, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Um, like I said, like Steve Bruce, Sam Allardyce, oh, I'm 64, I don't want to be out here we need a circuit breaker i don't want to be doing it you accepted a job on in the middle of december it's not like it had been forgotten about at this point yeah it's, it's not caught up on sort of come out of nowhere is it and it's just a case of like i say and as it was through the whole process of covid last year with regards to curtailing seasons every you you really really struggled to find somebody that wasn't just putting self-interest above of everything else with regards to finishing the season, carrying on the season, doing whatever they want. The teams that were in a good position wanted to finish it. The teams in a bad position wanted wanted to carry it on, and it went all the way through the summer to the vote like that. Um, just to finish off, um, Paul Lambert quotes um, and apologies if this is getting a little bit tedious for everyone listening. This is this is the last one, um, Craig. I wanted to come to you on this one. Um, because you um, you lifted the quote out and posted it on the Blue Monday WhatsApp group and on Twitter, I believe, as well. Um, Lambert um, talked about um, shifting from um, mass rotation to being more rigidly using his 4-3-3, 4-2-3-1 system um, and no plans to change. Um, quote, I learnt my lesson about five or six years ago trying to change systems left, right and centre and it never got me anywhere. I'll never do that again. I spoke to lots, loads of managers and they asked me why I changed the system. And I said I was trying to get a win. It, um, But they told me it just confused people and they were 100% right. And I'm talking about top managers, you know, not not bottom managers or, or you know, middle managers. We're talking top managers. Um, it conveniently forgot last season, right? <laughs> oh, my God. But surely as soon as he says that, doesn't that not just 
ring alarm bells and everyone who's in the press conference and reading, watching, listening, any anything, is completely contrary to what he did last year. Let's not worry about five or six years ago. What, what about last year then, mate, where you were changing it every match two or three times a week? It's just absolutely it, bizarre. He, he's got the front to come out and say it. Is this the closest it, we've it's got? It's just a walking to, um, contradiction, though, isn't it? Yeah, in, I was going to say. In yeah, everything yeah. he says is a contradiction, whether it's regards to tactics, transfers, policy, relationships, everything he says is... It's just like he just says the first thing that comes into his head and he he's, it's like he doesn't realise people have memories and sort of, of things what have happened. It, it's just a walking contradiction in everything he does. But, then he, but he doesn't care about it, does he, either? That's the thing. He's saying no. it. Bulletproof. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I was going to say, is, is this the closest we've got to him admitting his failures from last season? It, 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 got, it got us nowhere. Well, yeah, it got us 11th on points per game, mate. So, um... Anyway, uh, let's just finish off the news by talking about some transfer business. As always, I don't know whether you guys are finding this as well, but I'm always constantly frustrated with how blinkered our transfer business is, when it, particularly in January. We, it appears we've identified two targets, um, no contingencies. We are only going over after these two targets from the Championship on loan. Uh, one is Luke Thomas, who continues to make substitutes appearances for Barnsley. Um, make of that what you will. Um, the latest link this week um, is um, Matty Harrop from Preston North End, an attacking midfielder slash wide midfielder. I mean, these are logical targets um, in positions perhaps where we need some support or some creativity. Josh Harrop, I made a mistake. Sorry, I'm reading the wrong bit there. Josh Harrop from Preston North End. Um, I'd quite like a fullback perhaps, but... Um, Anyone want to give a take on this one? Danassian sounds like he's off to Accrington. Freddie Sears moved to Colchester, has had cold water pouring on that. Um, but yeah, Luke Thomas and Josh Harrop from Preston. Joe? Well, it was interesting listening to the Kings of Anglia pod last week. It was either the Monday or Thursday one. And they said that Lambert's getting frustrated that we aren't getting these deals over the line. But we've also, he's, or as a club, as a t- we've decided to, to only target people that are effectively on the fringes of the teams in the championship who are effectively match fit that will be able to come in and hit the ground running. So you're going after a player that in reality needs a couple of dominoes to fall above them yeah. for them to be able to be released. So I can understand the logic of wanting to sort of bring in players that match fit because in January we, we've seen it previously. You bring players in that aren't, that aren't ready and it takes to the end of the season before they're, even sort of close to contributing and it's just been an absolute waste of time so these are the players you need to get but ultimately they're either going to cost you more money and you're going to have to wait for them because teams just aren't going to give them up because like I say Luke Thomas came on again last night for Barnsley at Swansea didn't he or at at Barnsley against Swansea and Harrop seems close they've signed that Whiteman that might move things up but apparently it's definitely that we want both of them and see them both as starters but when will the deals get done? I guess, Craig, the frustrating thing for me is the, the lo- we, we, we're potentially paying a loan fee and or a large proportion of the wages for these two players. And you just wonder whether overall scouring the bottom end of League One or maybe the top end of League Two might yield a player just as good who is more likely to sign without having to play chess with other teams to get the deals done. Are you, are you, are you frustrated as I am that we appear to just have our pool that is so finite that it, once these deals don't happen, you know, where do we go next? Exactly. That's exactly what I was just about to say, is that we're fishing in such a tiny pool, aren't we? You know, and that's been the case for however many years now. Our scouting is non-existent, as we all know. Um, but yeah, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just that it's an e- a relatively easy way out, is that there's no real commitment just to get a loan in, is there? If you buy someone, you're tied in and if they could end up being a dud because you haven't done your due diligence and haven't done your scouting to find out if they are they are actually you know worthwhile signings, I suppose. But at least if you're getting a loan in, it's six months and then away you go at the end of it, regardless of regardless of the cost. I don't know, but it's, it's all very well them coming in. But as Joe said, they've got to be fit and they've also got to be allowed to play in a way that you know makes it worth everyone's while because you know there's no point bringing wingers in or attacking attacking wide men in if they're going to be asked to sit in a flat five and across the midfield yeah. either. But, it's, it, but it is a narrow pool that we're fishing in, but that's because if you want to have a player that's going to come in and make an instant impact, which is obviously what we're targeting, 
<laughs> there is a narrow pool. You're going to struggle to bring anyone in from the continent, especially with the Brexit rules with regards to where they need to be based and things. Generally, if you're signing someone from abroad in January, it's with a view on next season. Well, we're looking for this season, so we are stuck. And the t- players we want, Sunderland are going to want them. Um, Lincoln might want them. Apparently, we were in for Morgan Rogers that went to Lincoln ahead of us. So you don't know how strongly we were in for him, or did we move too slowly? Who knows? But ultimately, the squad is good enough, in my, in my yeah. view. Yeah, there's a couple of areas where we don't have it, but we, we have a full squad. We were only allowed to name 22 players. We have the 22 players. So if we bring in Josh Harrop, we're going to have to let one go. And it will probably be Janoy Dinashian, who's who we let go. And then you look at the squad. Kane Vincent Young is nowhere to be seen. And you're expecting Luke Chambers at 35 to play every single game, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday. Through the, And it's not just like when all oh, is bonkers. Saturday, it is literally every single Saturday and Tuesday for the whole of February and the whole of March. It's nine weeks in a row where we've got a Tuesday game. And that's before any cancellations and other games need to be fitted in. And effectively, Ken Lock is miles off it, it seems, at the moment. We're just, we're just going to run Chambers or Ward into the ground until one of them breaks down and then we're going to be screwed. This, the side of Danassian is, is really confusing given the lack of options at fullback. I, I'm shocked that we're not looking for someone who can play maybe both fullback positions. And I, well, coincidentally, well, like Danassian can play yeah. it, can't he? So why do you get, why get rid? Especially when, especially when the manager doesn't fall out with players as well. Wow. <laughs> Exactly right. The Good thing, the thing is, well, we, and the, 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 another reason why we're probably, well, potentially not looking for a, a signing as such is, you know, woe, woe betide things get worse and the manager gets sacked. The next man in is lumbered with a player that he doesn't like. Yeah, true. Referring again to Janoy Janassian, for example, you know, it may be that we make a change of manager. And because our director of football or head of footballing operations is a non entity, toothless, with no authority position, then there's no continuity across the club, as we all know. So it's just going to be recycle and start again. Yeah. Should we, should we move on to more positive stuff? I feel like we've kind of, I, I feel like I need to, you know, give us a bit of a lift. Let's talk about a victory, gentlemen, albeit a victory with plenty of um, context. <laughs> it's worth setting out, starting with the fact that it was Burton who we were facing uh, on Saturday. Um, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank back in charge. Um, after Jake Buxton was sacked um, off the back of a 1-0 win against Gillingham last week, um, but only three wins all season, 51 goals conceded, and since the defeat at Portman Road, they've conceded 17 goals in five games and find themselves bottom of the division. We've talked about Ipswich off the back of their disappointing return to form, uh, re- return to action, not to form, certainly, against Swindon. And and guys, the talking point here is the massive changes for players that were, um, were reported to have returned training in midweek and suddenly they're being thrust straight back into the action. Um, Thomas Holy, um, we'll talk about him in the questions if that's all right, um, regains his place, his first appearance since the defeat to Hull. Um, the back four, Ward, McGuinness, Chambers, Wolfenden, and his careless talk cost him a place in the lineup. And Toto and Ciala, um, out of nowhere since um, the defeat to Charlton where he went off injured, he returns in defence. Flynn Downs, no surprises, I guess, given he um, came off the bench against Swindon. He comes back in his first start, though, since MK Dons, um, and he's, he lines up alongside Andre Dizel. And then in our in our attacking midfield three, Bishop, his first appearance since Shrewsbury. Edwards, his first appearance since Portsmouth. And Alan Judge keeps his place. And again, similar to Downs, Norwood in making his first start since Charlton. Um, how many injuries were you anticipating us to pick up in the first half and I guess were you pleasantly surprised that that wasn't the case well we took a massive risk didn't we I, I, it's it was an it was a team sheet born out of desperation for the management team to get a result I don't think anyone could argue that because the way that sort of Teddy Bishop's in, injury history has been the way that James Norwood's recent injury history has been Gwion Edwards has been out for a long time but for those to come for those for those to all come into the team in one go and on a sort of a boggy pitch wasn't the best pitch was it for them to all come in in one go against a real sort of compact team was was a massive risk and I guess we'll find out in the next few days whether we've got away with it or not yeah Craig um I guess some interesting news off um 
well, not in the lineup. Um, Jackson and Hughes, there's no place even for them in on the bench. Um, I think Jackson travelled, didn't he? I don't know whether Hughes did. Um, they both what, travelled. Yeah. What, what's your reading of that? Um, it's a strange bench because there's, you'd think at least you've got Sears, Drinnen and Hawkins on the bench there. Would you not have a central midfielder in there given you've got Downs who's just coming back um, and Bishop potentially yeah. coming back who might not last out? Yeah, exactly. And we were told Nolan was fit. But Jackson played 90 minutes last week. 90 minutes. Like Dobra played 80 minutes last week. Jackson played 90 minutes last week. And neither of them are even on the bench this week. Jackson well, Dob- played Dobra has got five gone. of the last six games and he's not even trained with the first team this week. Yeah. He's, he's back down in the under-23s. So. Jackson, Jackson played 90 minutes pretty much in row A of the Pioneer stand, didn't he? He was that wide. He wasn't even on the pitch. He was pretty much <laughs> running along the gangway in front of in front of row A of the seats, but he's just been completely bombed out. And you know, I know I appreciate when we brought, spoiler alert, brought Drinnen and Hawkins on, we, it led to a goal, but they're both so similar styles of play. You'd think you need yeah. something a little bit yeah. different. On well, they're, the the exa- they're the exact same type of player, aren't they? Yeah. There's there's very few occasions where you're going to need to use both of them because two target men, yeah, yeah. So it it has to be for me. It has to be Hawkins or Drinnen and Jackson. It has to be, yeah. you have to go that way on the bench. You're just limiting your options. But I just don't see why. I see that sort of the need for it in some ways. But senior pro is being dragged up to Burton and just being left in the stands. It, it, that sort of thing doesn't sit right with. With them, and that, that's the sort of thing that comes back to hurt you with regards to man management of them. I was, bit, yeah. oh, sorry, sorry, Richard, as you were saying about needing new players, as Joe was saying, well, how big's your squad then if you've got Hughes and Jackson and Dobra not even in, not even on the bench, and you're still after more, even more players? Well, of course, yeah. it comes to a point where you've got to be getting a tune out of the squad that you've got, and certainly when you, once everyone's fit, that first 11 yesterday, it was frightening wasn't it should be in this division yeah well, well, you, got, look, well got you look at all the players that, that were outside the 18 yes they was Danassian in the 18 I don't think he was was he no, Danassian D- Wilson I know they're injured Scoose Nolan Jackson Hughes El Mazzuni Dobra that's, that's that's eight players squad. probably start for most teams in this league not even in the 18 and we want and we want two more players yeah um moving on to on to Burton um, four five one from from them. Um, worth mentioning a couple of signings for them. Hayden Carter comes in on loan from Blackburn, takes his spot in central defence. Sean Clare on loan from Oxford, and Josh Park assigned from Wickham. I think having been on loan there um, and giving hope to all of us in the latter stages of our thirties. Um, Luke Varney, Leicester spotted Luke Varney on the bench at thirty eight years of age. Player coached there at Burton. So good old Reg. Varney there. Um, moving on to the action, I mean, I've not got a huge amount of chat. We'll talk about just before half time and the big chance that Burton have. But the only thing I've noted down here, guys, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, is Entiala did a lot of good defending, albeit there was some last gasp defending that always makes me worried he's conceded a foul and a penalty, but some good interceptions. Um, and we just, we the, the sideways centre-backs passing to each other approach appeared to have been shifted into something different, which was sending crosses in for no one. And in fact, in the first <laughs> half, 14 crosses attempted, only two reached a town shirt. That's a 14% success rate, according to Sofa Score. Um, no shots on target, no big chances. Um, what was your... Before we talk about the Burton effort... Your thoughts, Craig, on, on what you saw from Ipswich? It, it was underwhelming, wasn't it, to put it lightly? As ever. As ever. Um, stats. Stat put, a, stat put a stat out, didn't he? Um, at the Over the weekend. We haven't, was it, we haven't been leading at half-time in 17 yeah. games. The last oh. 17 um, league games. Yeah. Games, which is a record, a club record. And as Joe's pointed out, we're setting negative club records in the third tier of English football. <laughs> yeah. mm. oh, oh, yeah, Something oh, to behold. The, the the players returning from injury, um, I think Downs yeah, was probably look... decent, wasn't he? And yeah, well, Edwards had moments, fair, but maybe not enough. 
Norwood. Bishop looked good, didn't he, first off? Yeah. Bishop's first touch took him past one or two players, didn't he? He's literally his first touch of the game in the first 20, 30 seconds showed exactly why you want Bishop in the centre midfield, does it? It just gets you up the pit. Well, in theory, it gets you up the pitch. I thought Edwards looked a bit rusty out of the out of those three downs. He contributed Bishop. well defensively, Edwards, Edwards though, didn't he? But... Yeah, yeah. But he, if you look at the heat maps, he didn't get any anywhere near forward, did he? I think Chambers got a lot more forward than, than Edwards did, to be fair to him. Mm. Downs looked a bit off, off pace, but he would do because he hasn't been, hasn't been playing. So... As you said, Rich, you've got to hope that the minutes they did get in their legs yesterday will stand him in good stead for two difficult matches coming up. Just before half-time, Enciala, um heads wide from a kind of a looping, high-played um, corner from Dizel. That was a chance where probably he should do better there. He's He's got above his, his man and is right in the middle of the goal. Probably should get that on target. And then and then Chambers is the hero here. Um, Edwards gets in behind. It's a looped ball into him. Um his cross kind of I don't know if it deflects or it just loops up and Holy kind of loses it in the in the air, it bounces off the bar. Um and Vernon is um unmarked at the far post and heroically chambers like a bodyguard jumping across stage to catch the bullet. Um jumps in front of the ball at close range and, and prevents a certain goal. And that's that's half time, Joe, and I've I've not missed anything, have I? It it was that unremarkable. No, you, it was <laughs> terrible. I'd say we I tweeted at half time we've had 60% of possession against a team with the worst defence in the in the league probably one of the worst in the country I haven't checked the other leagues and we have not created one single chance we had a, a sort of a header drift wide from a corner that was literally the the sum of our all our attacking contributions to that half and 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 the, the second half really doesn't change too much we've got this we've got this interesting moment on 55 where um norwood receives treatment is is the referee sends him to the side of the pitch and then um the fourth official gets all kinds of abuse so you can <laughs> i think the clip has been put on twitter you can watch it back um lots of f words i don't know what that means but lots of swear words um and norwood norwood gets booked for re-entering um, the, the field of play without the referee waving him on. That was a weird situation. The fourth official apparently said he could go on and then the referee says no. Was a, I've not seen that before. I think, I think so, I've seen a card, perhaps. For... Yeah, old mate, he got sent off, didn't he, against us for, for encroaching, didn't he, before the... That was last season, wasn't it? He got sent off for the second yellow for doing that. But it was like two minutes beforehand, Norwood, if the camera went to Norwood and he was just just prone on one knee, wasn't he? Just sort of contemplating life and the, the futility of it all. He didn't look injured. He was literally just on one knee in the middle of the half, just yeah, yeah, and he was isolated. where it all went wrong. Oh, yeah, I could have gone, I could have gone to Fleetwood. Um, and he, and I, think it, I think it was quite clear, though, that the fourth official waved it back on the pitch. You could you could see the fourth official give him a sign on the, on the TV coverage of it. And then, obviously, Norwood isn't happy that he's getting booked for it, but I think he might have even got a second yellow and he carried on much longer. I was going to but... say, yeah. But the fourth official clearly clearly told him we can get back on the pitch, so you, you do have some sympathy with regards to to it. It was it was an interesting talking point in a game that lacked that lacked them, and then Norwood is subbed five minutes later for Aaron Drynan. Um and then, and there's a, a chance for for Burton, um, but this is the, this is the moment I guess where the game a period of Ipswich dominance really stemmed from from this chance for Drynan. It's it's Chambers is twisting and turning down the right hand side. It's kind of a low cross that Bishop does really well actually to guide to Drynan and he loops ahead of back across goal and hits the bar and, and you kind of felt at that moment um Ipswich were were actually we were finally getting on top, Craig, or you're looking kind of pensive at that. Yeah, no, no, we were. We were the better we? team at that point, weren't yeah, we? Yeah, we were. Yeah, yeah, we were. Burton offered very little at the start of the second half. Um, I wouldn't say we were car- carving them open, and that was pretty much the only chance we'd created before before we scored. Um, yeah, Ch- I thought Chambers did well yesterday. To be fair, he, I thought he was he was getting forward a lot more than he had been in yeah, recent a matches. Of, he got into the the. I think he got behind the beyond the goalkeeper in the first first half. Yeah, two or three times he did that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, but you know, if you're relying on your 35 year old fullback to create your chance, do what your one chance in the first 15 minutes of the second half, then read into that what you will. Uh, Hawkins comes on for Bishop, and uh, we go uh, two up top, and immediately Craig um, is going to make an immediate, like a real tangible impact because. Um, 
Bishop will win a free kick down the left hand side and do you want to talk us through the the action as you recall it? It's a uh, Yeah. You're judge again you're looking his, kind of pensive. Judge puts in, I'm just trying to think how, Judge puts in his umpteenth shit cross of the match, doesn't he? Um, and it luckily gets a deflection off a Burton defender and it takes out the entire Burton team, yeah. pretty much the trajectory of the ball and McGuinness is powering in at the far post to score his first goal. And that's pretty it? much that's that's all she wrote. A rare set piece goal. And and McGuinness cool. should should weigh in with more goals from set pieces. You're right about the set piece. Judge's free kick looked like it was destined to hit the first man. Well it it did, yeah. didn't it? Because it then looped yeah. off of him. But um yeah, got to I be in there. McGuinness, I thought McGuinness played worse today again. I think yeah. he won a lot of he won a lot of headers, didn't he? Again yesterday, which is sort of what he does. Um him and him and Nciala, I thought both played well. Probably our men men of the match, regardless of the goal. Yeah, and the goal probably on the balance of play at that point um, deserved. And then John's got another effort, um, a, low, a header that goes down. He kind of heads it into the ground. The keeper gets down low quick to save it. Garrett in goal there. Um, Sears comes on for Edwards. I didn't think Edwards... I think that felt like a game too soon for Edwards, perhaps. So, don't, Joe, your thoughts on Edwards? Yeah, no, totally agree. I, th- I thought he did a lot of good work sort of coming backwards rather than going forwards yesterday which I think is one of the things we've missed with having either sort of Dobber or Jackson on the flanks the actual natural wingers out there who have the sort of nous and game smarts to defend and I know Sears this season hasn't been particularly good going forwards but ultimately Sears and Ward down the left and Edwards and Chambers down the right is when we've looked our most solid because they've actually been able to get back and support their their fullback and allow the fullback to get into attack with them so Yep. We'll see where we go going forwards with the with the wide rolls, whether Edward stays on the left, whether Sears comes back into the team. I, d- I don't know which way we'll go on that. And and last 10 minutes, um, you know, this is, uh, this is the criticism, I guess, of this performance and people tempering any kind of optimism about this win because knowing Ipswich, there's always going to be a chance for the opposition. Um, one is, con- is totally contrived out of nothing by NCR, who'd actually had a pretty pretty decent game actually um, but he slices a clearance <laughs> towards his own goal which is pretty impressive and Holy actually reacts quite well to save that it's quite a good reaction save uh, given how close Enciala is in there but this is the chance Aikens um, pulls the back ball across goal I think it misses the forward um, Hemmings I think um, and it's the new signing Parker who runs onto the ball and hits it first time and really with the whole goal to aim at he should do better um, but Town see it out, and that's a one-nil victory. Um, and um, I wanted to know whether you agree with Stuart Taylor's post-match opinions, because as much as we hear great things from the press conference and from Lambert, um, his number two also is uh, is a, quite the philosopher. Um, let me let's pick the right bit. You said um, philosopher there, Rich, instead of bullshitter. Yeah, sorry, that's why. Well, it's, they're synonyms of each other. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this last bit. Coming away from home, especially to Burton, um, keeping a clean sheet and getting a 1-0 result is fantastic. Fantastic. Especially with the way the league is going this season. Everybody can see people are dropping points all over the place and it's very, very close. Um, I think sometimes a 1-0 is better than a 5-0 because you're seeing the game out and you're showing that strength and defensive qualities. It was really pleasing to get one today, Joe. When was the? Do you do you prefer a one nil over a five nil? Do you like that defensive those <laughs> defensive qualities I, coming to the fore? I, I can understand the point he's trying to make that it sort of shows the sort of character of the team, sort of digging their heels sort of in at the end of the game. But I'd, I'd rather a five nil personally. I'd but, rather a one nil against Sunderland or Peterborough. Well, just anyone good. <laughs> a win against anyone good would be great. Yeah, Burton. I wouldn't be. I'd 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 be kind of thinking. A 5-0 is probably what we should be expecting. But, but the, 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 the problem we have is that we we don't beat any good teams in the league. So it means that there's so much pressure heaped onto these games against the teams at the bottom of the league. So when we lose one, like we did to Swindon last week, it is a disaster. Because if we don't beat the teams at the top of the league, you have to keep winning those bottom of the... And it, it, meant, it made yesterday's game sort of harder than it should have been. And... I say we we didn't play well. We didn't create anything. It's not a performance to write home about. But you do have to give them some credit for sort of the way they did get the result over the line with sort of players coming back with a set piece goal with some 
good defender, like you say, I'd probably our three best players were probably NC Ireland, McGuinness and Luke Chambers. And that's not really want, what you want away from Burton. But the problem is it's sort of a, it's a one nil win that you'd expect when you're a team in the middle of the table, going to the top of the top of the t- table side, the way we played. But ultimately it's, it is three points. It's, it is a good thing, but and, until we sort of, be a decent team it doesn't change anything with regards to my view on sort of Lambert's future and like I say if, if we don't beat either of Peter Brewer or Sunderland in the next two games then the trigger has to be pulled for me and Craig did we learn anything tactically about this game or was to Joe's point about the squad the, the team selection is this for you just I don't want to put words in your mouth so but I'm gonna um, this felt like um, um, do what it takes to get the three points, this was a short. Um, this is a stick in plaster victory, isn't it? Or do, you, or was there anything there apart from the return from injury of quite a few key players, which is obviously a really good thing and actually might make a real impact in the next couple of weeks against better opposition. But do we take anything apart from the three points, as Joe said, as a positive to to build on? Are there any green shoots? You, you mean is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Um, no, no, there weren't. Were there really? Other than. Other than, as you say, it's the return to fitness. We, as we know, and as we've spoken about many, many, many times before, there are no real tactics. There are, there is no real pattern of play. So you are now reliant on those guys who are coming back to fitness. Edwards, Bishop, in the main, the guys who were who took us up to the top of the league at the beginning of the season. You're now relying on them doing something off the cuff in the next half of a season. To, to propel us back up the league again, aren't you? That's pretty much what we're resting our the rest of our season on. Yeah, we need to go back to the the Blackpool rapid fire long range shot approach, which you know worked against Blackpool, didn't it? But yeah, Norwood for me was isolated. He, he worked hard yesterday, but was again isolated. It doesn't seem to yeah. matter who who plays in that one up top on their own. It just isn't body around. Nobody them, near but... him. No, absolutely nobody near him. And as I started saying about the guys who are they're trying to get in, well, it's all very well getting them in, but they're going to play in that system then they're going to be as toothless as the guys who are currently there mm. and i think the problem with the system that we've got is that it it's not just a couple of roles where it asks so much of the players it's almost every role on the pitch the fullbacks have to be able to get up and down the whole pitch all game defend a whole flank on their own effectively and contribute in an attacking sense the wingers have to be able to get back while also get close to strike and be creative again tough roles which the striker is so isolated he has to play such a tough role. The most forward of the midfielders is being relied on to effectively carry the ball in tight spaces, beat three or four men to make anything happen. Dazelle is just a, a passenger at times defensively, which means his partner, whether it be Flynn Downs yesterday or Emma Hughes last week, has such a big workload to do. It, it means that you, almost almost every player on the pitch needs to be at the top of their, needs to be a top player in the league and at the top of their game just so the system doesn't fall down. Yeah, and you've got two sitting midfielders as there there as well, and you kind of think, I get away at Burton. Is that really really the way to go? I know Downs kind of marauds a little bit, and Dozel goes looking for the ball, but you just, I, I just wonder whether a four three three yesterday, a proper four three three, might have been the better way to go. But then, you, but then if you do that, you can't really play Dozel in that team. Yeah. So well, it's we we try and get him into the team, but ultimately, if you want to play him deep, we. We saw it against Swindon. You need somebody alongside him. When we played Burton at home, Emma Hughes played a lot deeper and sat alongside him. When we played him away, Flynn Downs is the one that sat alongside him. But he needs he needs some strength, some physicality, some defensive now, some running alongside him. Otherwise, he's just we're just very easy to attack against if he doesn't have that. It feels like more questions than answers, which is almost the perfect segue as if I planned it. Um, for for um, our listener questions, um, Steve Jackson, goal pro- app, goal projection, always a good follow. Um, post some really interesting stats. Um, why does Lambert keep switching the goalkeepers? I know context is important, but I think Holy has clearly been our best League One goalkeeper, and he's posted um, some stats about goals conceded, xG conceded, um, and win percentage. And Holy um, has uh, has got the highest win percentage out of the. Out of Cornell, he's also put Norris in there. Um, what your thoughts about the flip-flopping on the goalkeeper? Uh, did I say Craig? Or I wanted to go to Joe because he's got the goalkeeper top on, but <laughs> either, either of you can answer it. Yeah. Um, I think last year 
it seemed that Holy started the season, started the season well, which meant that Lambert couldn't bring in Norris, who was his preferred keeper, into, into the lineup. And it seemed that as soon as he had any excuse to make the change, he made it because Holy, I think after the sort of the amazing 11 game start where we'd won eight and drawn three, at one point he was sort of 30 minutes away from an all time club record when we were sort of close to setting good records rather than bad records for, <laughs> for not conceding a goal. And, we lost 2-0 at Accrington, 2-0 at Rotherham, where he didn't really do anything wrong in either game. And he was straight out of the team. And I don't know, it just seems, for whatever reason, we do seem to play better with Holy in goal, whether it's his sort of command of the area, like the, the fact that when he kicks the ball, it stays kicked and it gets down the other end of the pitch away from the goal. But like I say, I, I thought he'd started this season. He'd looked a bit shaky and I could see why Cornell was getting an opportunity. But... Ultimately, I know some. I, I, was, I was actually having this conversation on Twitter with Olimar and a couple of others yesterday, and sometimes it's just oh, it's just overcomplicating things. He is a keeper that has a really good clean sheet record, a really good games one record, and you can make excuses as to whether it's weaker opposition, whether he's doing enough. But ultimately, we're there to try and win games of football, and it, and if the keeper is a is one that gives you a better chance of doing it because he keeps more clean sheets then sometimes you just got to go with that until he really plays himself out of form at least exactly. and that's it it's, and if the keeper's one less thing to worry about then all's well and good isn't it if you asked a hundred Ipswich Town fans where's the issue in our team there's not many of them be saying it's bloody Thomas Holy yep no and we and we stopped the um the short passing yesterday out the back which I think probably is if you ask me the way to go but anyway what um, would um, Jimmy Walker think about oh, that oh Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was trying to dangle that in subtly. If you don't know what we're talking about, you'll find that on Twitter. Um, our goalkeeping coach um, dropped a view in during Liverpool, Man United. Um, Ashley Eldon, um, Craig, um, I, and I think this is a really, um, really interesting thought as well about you know, green shoots and a long-term plan with Lambert in charge. Um, who or what um, has Lambert Im- improved in his time here? I, I'll focus you in on the who. We've talked about you know, the community stuff and the PR when he was first joined to the club. But who, in your opinion, has been, has, their game has been brought on by working under Lambert and his, and his coaching team? I can't think of anyone. I saw this question and I can't think of anybody. Nobody that wouldn't have, sorry, nobody that isn't of an age where they wouldn't have improved in any case because they're just getting older and more experienced through virtue of playing more matches. People like Downs, for example. I couldn't think of a player that's got any better through the coaching that they would have received. Not not that you can you know, quantitatively look at and, and come back with any sort of evidence. I'd say other than just by period of over period of time, just getting better because you're getting older. I think, I think sort of in, in, that might be a little unfair to Lambert because ultimately he does have to be the one that plays them and downs and sort of Andre Dazelle this season where he's actually been given a long run in the team are things that, Yes, they've improved, but he's put them in a position to allow them to improve. It's quite it's quite easy just to take all the credit away from him, but ultimately he is the manager that is allowing them to play and, and they are playing well. He's only picking them though, isn't he? He is. He's doing. If you're saying yeah. that he's, they're getting minutes, then the, the, the reason why they're getting better is because they're getting minutes. But he, he could easily not be playing Andre De Zell this year, couldn't he? You could, you could easily have set up a midfield three with Nolan, well, obviously Scooter's injured, Bishop... Choose. He but could have, he could have gone with the more experienced players. I was going to say to Craig's point, though, him better, though. Is, is you're, giving him, you're giving him more game experience, aren't you? Which yeah, okay. yeah, but that's, that was my point, though, wasn't it? He's getting yeah. better because he's playing. He's playing. He's not being. He's not being coached to become a better no. player. You know, he's just getting it through the virtue of playing more often than and, 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 uh, and Andre Dazelle's abilities are largely innate, aren't they? As well, I, I suspect most of the most of what he does is unconscious. Those, you know, the unlock the door but through ball passes. It, I'm sure those. You know, and if Dizel if Dizel, if Dizel was getting coached better, he'd be getting better defensively. True. Maybe. Jury's out on that one, Ashley. Um, Mark Rogers. Uh, I mean, this is the, these kind of questions are inevitable, Joe. Um, and it's just luck of the draw that I'm doing alternates, and it's, this one's come to you. Um, would you rather? This is from Mark Rogers. Would you rather win against Peterborough and Sunderland, or lose them both, but Lambert goes? I'll ask you both about that one. Um, well, if if we win it, like I, I just, 
it's difficult because it's it's one of those sort of hypothetical questions like if a supermodel asked you out on a date would you go on it and it's like well i probably wouldn't check my wife because it, <laughs> it's not going to happen and that's how i feel about the wins against peterborough and sunderland but ultimately if, if we beat peterborough and we beat sunderland and we beat them in a manner that sort of suggests that a corner has been turned then yeah that's that's what we'd all want as fans but I just, I just, I just don't for one second see it. I'd be, I'd be amazed if we win one of those games, let alone both of them. Yeah, Craig, are you, are you similar on that one? Yeah, absolutely. If we, I mean, if, if we, we lose both of them, if... he's going to go anyway, probably, isn't he? Or not? Oh, God, or I does that know. win no, yesterday on Saturday buy him more time? We all, we all know. As I said on Twitter, we all know we're going to, we were going to, even before yesterday, we all knew we were going to scrape against, scrape a win against Burton, probably lose against Posh because they always seem to dick us, and then draw because Sunderland draw everything 1-1 it's just the way it's going to be get your money on it now I think if if we were to lose both matches I don't think we would be a million miles away from the from the top six you know because it's so everyone is beating everybody and it is still stupidly condensed and we've been on a pretty well hot and cold run and are still within touching distance of the playoffs so if that if that is the cause to have the sticking sticking plaster ripped off then yeah, probably I'd go for that. The, uh, the issue with these fixtures, and this was a problem last year, is losing not only hurts your chances, you're giving points to the teams Six around points. you. Yeah. You'd be better off... I'd, I would take not losing both of these matches as being a positive, really, because they don't they they don't go further away from us, do they? Well, Su- well Sunderland are, are, be- are below us at the moment, aren't they? So if, if we lose to them and also lose to... Peterborough, we're going to be four or five points off the playoffs at that point, and we're going to have lost two more games against promotion contenders. And like I say, Portsmouth have kept five clean sheets in a row against us, Hull, I think Peterborough as well. Like they've, they've kept five clean sheets against three of the top sides, if you include us in that. And that gap is just going to start to grow between the top two and us in the sort of fighting for the top six. And it's like, we shouldn't be fighting for a top six place. We should be fighting for the title. That's what, that should be the aim. What's the point of aiming to get in a one in four chance of getting promoted? The aim should be the top two. And we should be judging our progress against where we sit against the top two, not where we sit against the top six. Yep. Here, here. Um, Craig, James Chidwick, I'm trying to be positive. Good for you, James. You're doing better than the host. Um, could you let Lambert <laughs> off um, saying it was a win? Um, a good run out for players who've been injured and lack match sharpness before two crucial games. Yeah, you could. Well, you? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we and we did say that, didn't we? So that if it's if it's minutes in the legs for Downs and Bishop and Edwards in the main, who you're going to be relying on to do most of the attacking and creation of chances in the next couple of matches, then yeah. So you know, let's let say let's see. Let's see where we are in what ten days' time. And 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 Dav Blue's question: What are the green shoots that Evan sees? We I think we've dealt with that more holistically when yeah. he said it at the time. But the green shoots surely are the likes of Bishop and Edwards, who actually are game changers themselves. Look, coming they back are to hanging everything, fitness. aren't they? They are hanging absolutely everything on injuries and people returning from injury, yeah. and that being it. You know, every press conference. Lambert's mentioning injuries more than he's mentioning Germany at the moment. That shows you how much well, propaganda there is. We being get we get club it. updates from the um, training ground. It seems every day. When normally, when the, the sort of interviewers and the media ask about injuries, it's like, don't know, don't know. Oh, he's on the grass. Oh, I think he's okay. Oh, I think I saw him yesterday. Now it's club website. Oh, these guys are back in training today. Oui. These guys are back today. Yes. No low. Might be back Friday. No low. No low's coming back. No yeah. low is yo lowing with his training account. <laughs> um, Joe, um, Tyg asks, um, we scored as the change was made, but have you ever seen a bizarre front two as Drynan and Hawkins? Both good at holding the ball up, but neither is the player you'd want it held up for. He's, he's got a point, hasn't he? We talked about <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's what we said earlier, isn't it? Why those two ahead of Jackson? It should be it has to be one of those two and Jackson because if that game goes and they're our front two, what are we going to do? Um, Chris London, boy, a London tractor boy. Um, well, that was crap. I can't believe how many times I've said that after winning the past two years. Why do we keep on playing high balls to a lone strike to flick onto their sweeper? Um, Toto played well and Chambers was the only one to run through the thirds um, with the ball. I think to get yeah. the ball. I'm not sure he had the ball at his feet for most of it, but... Yeah, I think well, I think Bishop did to start with. I think I thought I was really impressed with the way Bishop started the match, um, and he was. You could actually see he was he was jinking past. He was back almost back to his 
drinking best. Um, but yeah, so I completely agree with Chris there. I think um, quite a lot of free kicks as well, didn't he, Bishop? And, and yeah, and as he's, yeah, and uh, thankfully we're so good from free kicks. They pretty much all <laughs> resulted in a uh, shot on target, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, but, they did. but you but you look at like the last eleven, twelve games. We've won four games, and it's that that win against Shrewsbury where they were awful, and we nicked it right at the very end. The Plymouth away win where we only scored when they went down to ten men. The Burton home win where sort of nicked to two one with a late goal. But in fairness, we did dominate that game, did deserve to win that one. And then yesterday where we've nicked one. So we've won four times in ten games, all against sides that were well, three of them against teams that were in the relegation zone at the time and one against sort of Plymouth. It's like you, we're just beating the crap and we're and we're not beating them well either. And it's at they sort of say a side of a good team is when they win but don't play well. What it's, you're not a good team if you never play well, are you? Though that's what that's Danny Cowley said on the uh, EFL Quest show was, was a sign of a good side. Um, and then he mentioned, I think someone mentioned, then we had um, Peter Brun Sunderland coming up next. Um, FBL Tractor, um, Joe, I'll come back to you. Um, it was a tough, uh, it was tough fought, um, but do you think we deserved to win that relegation six pointer? FBL's Tractor, no, it's not mine. I, I don't know that we did deserve to win it. To be honest, I just. I had I just had a look at the XG on the game. Burn great they score those chances, don't they? We were 0.5 or 0.6. They were 0.8. It was a game of very limited quality from both sides, and it was going to take sort of a scrappy goal was going to win it. We got the scrappy goal. Chambers managed to make the good block to stop their scrappy goal, and it, ultimately it was just a game of very very little quality decided by. I wouldn't even say it was decided by a moment of quality, was it? It was decided by. Right, a goal place, right, for right. fitting the match, a shit free kick that deflected up to somebody who was free. Yep. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to find positive stuff. I really am, but um, I'm not going to pretend that something. I, I'm not like Paul Lambert. I'm not disingenuous. Um, skip through some of these. Scoey seventy five. I think we dealt with your um, question about um, Lambert swapping formation quotes. Um, crab walk, Craig. Who will leave the club first, Lambert or Wolfenden? The new person. Uh -oh. Persona non grata. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, uh, yeah, a bit like Joe. I, I don't have quite as many um, entries into the changing room as, as Jeffing room as Joe does. But a friend of a friend has a contact with Luke, and yeah, pretty much backs up what Joe's been saying about harmony and people getting along, etc. But Lambert will go. Twenty seventh of January. Is that yeah, what you were long, looking? As long as, as, long as you were looking as, before, is there a calendar? Yeah, yeah, you? I've got a calendar. <laughs> as, long as, as long as Wolf, as long as Wolf is not sold before the twenty second, twenty seventh of January, yeah. then it'll outlast him. Yeah. We need well, that I five million. If Lambert was in charge United. of transfer, if Lambert instead of Mark Evans was in charge of transfer policy, I'd imagine the answer might be different. Um, Paul Westlake, um, from what I can see, a deflection will be a good finish. Um, a safe Lambert for another week. I think you've said that. Um, love to hear uh, or oh, best 11. I think we get asked that a lot. I don't think we've got the time to do best 11s, but I think we're close, aren't we, with that team? Apart from yeah. Vincent Young, perhaps? Is that yeah. is that the strongest was, team on paper? I, 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 do, I do think with Vincent Young at the moment, you almost need to... Write him off? Just not, 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 not write him off, but forget about him for the, yeah. for the very near future because he's had, another, he's had another setback. He's not being mentioned by the club at all, which means he's three, four, five weeks away at best. That's, that's 10 games time in reality. You just can't... If, if, we get, if we get 10 starts out of him this season, I'll be amazed. Think, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not one of those who's going over to him and said, oh, we'll never see him in an Ipswich shirt again. But ultimately, if, if he starts 10 games for us this season, it's going to be a massive surprise. I think, I think that, that 11 is, is pretty much as good as... It. Maybe you'll play, you'll play Judge. I thought Judge played quite well last week, didn't he, in the number 10 when he was, when he was actually playing in the final 30 feet. I thought he did quite well. Um, but... In terms of 11 fit players being available, that starting 11 yesterday is pretty much as good as it's going to get, I'd have thought. Uh, I, wonder, I wonder with regards to, because we're not, we seem to go away from passing out from the back a lot more at the moment, whether you end up going downs in a deeper role with sort of Nolan and Bishop in front of them to try and get a little bit more goal for it. Um, I just wanted to flip it around. There's a question here, and apologies in advance, because I'll, I'll get your name wrong. You need to tweet me to how to pronounce it. I'm going to go for Cinder Eliasson. Um Do you Cindere. think the starting Cindere. Cindere. Um Do you think the starting eleven yesterday on paper is the most underachieving of this town side ever? Maybe let's bring the negativity. Oh, my light's gone off. That's fine. Um, 
I'd say so at least for as long as I follow the club. Games like that only fade and become a poor, um, become a battle because we let it happen. Poor management. Um, um, Ian Aitchison adds dropping the possession type of game is welcome too, but why not two up front? Um, your thoughts on Sindra's point about um, most underachieving side, given the potential strength that we've talked about, um, and the two up front. Who wants to say that? Well, I think the underachieving side. I think it's difficult because we're in a league which we expected or hoped to get out of last year and we expected to we, we didn't expect to come 11th in it and we don't expect to come 11th in it again this year which is looking like it could happen so almost every player you look at it you got in goal holy has done fine really chambers has obviously been a good player for us in the championship and his sort of career is winding down a bit now ward started well hasn't hasn't been great for a long time really for me toto was bought in as a Eight hundred thousand pound centre back has been pretty rubbish. Generally, he, he was obviously he's had some decent games this year, but he's been a poor signing in the long term. He signed as a Championship defender, remember? McGuinness can't really say anything about him. Dazelle burst onto the scene at sixteen, and now five six years later, he's finally establishing himself in the team. Judge has been a massive disappointment. Norwood's coming in on the back of thirty goals a season, and has been sort of more renowned for what he's done off the field than on the field since he's been here. Edwards was brought in as a championship winger and bar a good run of form this year has done very little. I say every, every player is really underachieved from what we expected of them, but I guess that's to be expected when you are a mid table league one side. Um, and Craig finally on the four, four, two point from Ian. Um, we're, Lambert is pretty clear that we're not going to change formation now, are we? Um, but, are you an advocate for the four four F and two, given how yeah. isolated the striker is? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think, yeah, as you, as you say, Lambert's gone on record to say we can't play um, with two up front or we're useless at it, whatever his comment was. But I just wonder, sort of as Joe's alluded to just just a little while ago, is once Downs is back and fully fit, you could then play two central midfielders in a four four two. I don't think you can play Dazel in a four four two. You know, he doesn't do enough. In, you know, as the central, as two, one of a central two. Whereas if you had Nolan and Downs as your central two, then you probably could get away with it, um, and therefore, you know, release someone to play up front alongside Norwood or Hawkins or or whoever. I think that's. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we do it once Downs is fully up up to speed and and fit and firing, then Nolan maybe as well that we do try it. Do you think he did Bish- that? Bishop did it in the sort of playoff season. He played in the two that a lot yeah. that season, didn't he? So yeah. Like I say, you you need to be quite a complete midfielder to play in a two in a four four two. You got to, and you've got to have legs. That is one of the key things you've got to have. Yeah, I just think it's I think I think it's Dizel that's stopping them from playing two up front. Interesting. Um, we'll end on this one from Tim. Sorry to um to Tom Lee, um Peck and Blue. All really good questions. We've uh, I think we've dealt with most of them, and all they're quite long, um, hypothetical uh, kind of low um, slow burn questions that I don't think we have time for um, but let, let's deal with this one from Tim because it, it it helps with the the looking ahead to um to Peter and Sunderland to help you get back on time um, given the league position and the game is played um, played by all situation does the tunnel still have a light flickering at the end or will the form v top half clubs aka Peterborough and Sunderland in the next two snuff it out um, I'll go to both of you but I'll start with Joe for, for me, the light flickering at the end of the tunnel is the fact that the league has been pretty average so far. A lot of teams beating everybody that even though we've not done great and we've not beaten anyone yet, we're still in a decent position. But the the reason the light flickers for me is that, is that we've got a tough run of games coming up in sort of Peterborough, Sunderland and then Crewe after that. But mm. if Lambert can't pick up the results, we're still going to have half a season left for a new manager to come in and have another go at it. And I Genuinely, don't think there's many managers out there that could be doing a worse job at the moment. And Greg, is there any light at the end of the tunnel apart from a P45 for uh, Mr. Lambert? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's you know, without t- wishing to toe the the club line, it's a return of injuries, I suppose. That everyone seems to be hanging their hat on, um, and that's pretty much pretty much it. Unless the, the light at the end of the tunnel is showing the scuffle between the players that was had between management and uh, players after Swindon. 
no mutiny. Nothing to see here. Gentlemen, thank, thank you for answering those questions. And thank you to all of you um, for putting the questions in. Really helpful. Shaping the debate. Always um, good. And apologies if we um, didn't have time to read yours out. Let's just do a quick roundup before we, um, we finish off. Um, let me focus on the top half of results. Um, Lincoln still um, lead the way. Um, I think they, did they have a day off? I think they had a postponement. Um, Lincoln, so I don't think they played. Um, Hull, it was a one-all draw for them against Blackpool, um, whose I think whose form has dropped away, um, having had a bit of an unbeaten run there. Blackpool, I think they've regressed back to mid-table. Um, Portsmouth, um, one-nil victors over manager list. I think they're still managers. Fleetwood, Joey Barton mm. list Fleetwood Town. Um, Doncaster on a bit of a run as well. They've they lost their last game, but. Um, Four wins out of five for them, um, and they um, saw off Swindon, <laughs> who who are back into uh, their normal, um, yeah, <laughs> normal normal mode for Swindon. Um, and Peterborough um, opponents next week, um, <laughs> comfortable victors over MK Dons. Some nice goals in there. Um, Dembele looked good. Um, Smodic should had a bit of a run without scoring. Scored twice, I think. Um, so perfect timing for them to get back on form. Um, and then we mentioned Sunderland behind Ipswich. And that was my fault. I didn't spot that they were still behind. I thought Streaky Lee would have got them sorted, but they've no no defeats in the last... They're unbeaten in the last five. Um, mostly draws, as we said, but a 3-0 win away at AFC Wimbledon. Hat-trick for Charlie Wyke. Um, Accrington still amongst it, but they lost to Gillingham. Um, so as we said, the league is all over the place. Um, and a special mention to the entertainment yesterday was... Um, at Rochdale, three or draw with them for Wigan, and a nice tee, teed up, kick keepy uppy kind of goal for Will Keane. You can still find him. Um, worth a look on uh, Twitter or YouTube for that one. Um, Ipswich are seventh, 20 games played, 35 points, just outside the playoffs. Um, two games in hand on Charlton, who are one point above them. Um, but yeah, I think it, reading into the league table, I think at this stage is. Um, is pretty um, pretty useless given all of the games and postponements and so on. Um, but all of the top eight um, won or drew yesterday if they, if they played. So um, it's maybe tightening up, who knows. But that's it, and that is the end of the pod. Um, we've talked about Sunderland, um, we've talked about Peterborough. Um, anyone predicting any other than uh, Peterborough victory next week? I'll just, just throw it I, out I, there. I, I'd like to say it. Uh, I just don't see us being able to stop them from scoring, and, and we don't have any goals in us. That's Peter the, are, li- li- are lethal, issue. aren't they? That's the issue, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, they always they always look good against us as well, don't they? They always seem to turn it on against us. That four-one defeat to them at home was was a real low point of last season, wasn't it? Smodic as well played yeah. well, didn't he? If he's coming yeah. back to form, it doesn't bode well. Um, I think it's Ben who is back um, hosting next week for the pod, um, so keep a lookout for him and whoever else is. I'm sure one of you two guys will be we back on um, and um, yeah you can find us at Blue Monday ITFC on the Twitter and we're on Instagram Blue Monday pod team we're on the YouTube um, podcast you can get us on Spotify Google Acast Apple all the big all the big names all the big names on there give us a subscribe give us a review if you want as well I was touring through the reviews of um, the podcasts um, and there's some five stars in there some interesting not five star reviews as well um, so um, yeah Keep us entertained by giving us a review. Always appreciate those. Um, guys, so make c- sure they're five star. Make sure, well, yeah, exactly right. Five star. Um, rain, Joe, or sh- rain or shine, leave us a five star review. <laughs> exactly right. Um, Joe, where can we find you on Twitter? Any, uh, the Academy, is COVID kind of impacting? It's back to no, the there was FA- supposed to be a game yesterday, but it was cancelled because of the snow that turned up ah, Saturday yes. morning. We're due to be playing Colchester, but it's the FA Youth Cup has been put on hold, so which is a shame for the youngsters because. We obviously run a decent run in that, so like I said, I, I, there's due to be games. I think there's another 23s game this week, but it's it's whether these games go ahead. I'm sure there's going to be quite a, a few cancelled at relatively short notice as the fixtures pile up. And Craig, where can we find you? Uh, Fims 75. Excellent, and you can find me at Ipswich. And that is your lot. Thank you for listening. I said I wasn't going to drag it out, and I'm 10 minutes overrun, so 10% extra no it's not right my maths is crap i'm gonna end it there i'm gonna end it there my brain thank you very much joe um who wants to have the final words um does anyone want to have the final word has anyone got any clever anything clever to say roll on peter bro